I'm Marina Jureka with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. After landing on Mars last week, NASA's Perseverance rover took its first look around. We are getting an initial look at just how powerful the cameras on board the rover are. From the never before seen entry, descent and landing video to the MassCam Z camera system, capturing a panorama of the landscape in unprecedented detail. We have been able to see the surface of Mars as never before. The Perseverance rover has 19 cameras on board, ready to explore. Today, I am joined by a team of experts who will be using the MassCam Z camera system throughout the mission, and they will show us the highest resolution shots of the red planet yet in a moment. If you are joining along in the conversation and would like to ask one of the scientists or engineers a question, you can pop it into the social feed you are using with the hashtag Countdown to Mars. Joining me today is Jim Bell, the principal investigator for the MassCam Z instrument. Elsa Jensen of Malin Space Science Systems, who leads operations for sending commands to the MassCam Z instrument. Kjartan Kink of the Neil Bohr Institute of the University of Copenhagen, who led the design and construction of MassCam Z's calibration targets, which are used to tune the instrument settings. Thank you so much for joining me here today, guys. Great to be here, Marina. Thanks for having us. Yes, yeah. thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Now, Jim, we spoke before landing on your anticipation for the camera shots you would be getting. Is it living up to what you dreamed it would be? Oh, my gosh. Oh, I mean, remember when we talked about it and we were trying to make predictions and I made a crazy prediction. This is going to be a feast for the eyes, right? All these incredible cameras, uh, you know, you mentioned the 19 on the rover. If you count the ones on the descent stage, if you count the ones on the helicopter, you know, we're talking about 25 cameras on this rover. Just unbelievable image rich. And I think we were all blown away by the videos, right? By those incredible, the parachute and the thing and the stuff. And it's like, what? It's just really hard to believe that all of that worked, even though many of us kind of knew intellectually what to expect. Uh, emotionally, it was like we were blown out of the water. It was incredible. And and a lot of us are having uh, on the mass cam ZTM are having the same experience with the pictures we're taking with these zoom cameras. Absolutely breathtaking. I think everybody around the globe has mm -hmm. just been so inspired by it all. Now, you mentioned that the first images you ever saw of Mars were from the Viking landers. Now, how does that compare with what you're seeing now? Yeah, so, you know, the, the first successful landing on Mars back in uh, 1976, and uh, the two Viking landers, one and two, set down on the surface, and very different camera systems than we, we use today. But for the time, they were, you know, designed and built in the early 1970s. They were just incredibly cutting edge, incredibly state of the art, uh, but also very, uh, very simple compared to today's cameras. The Viking cameras had... Uh, basically single detectors and they were scanned up and down and then moving along the side, kind of like a fax machine almost. And so I remember being a kid watching on the nightly news, the first pictures coming down from Mars and they were coming down in these little strips like, you know, and it was like watching paint drip down the wall and little bit at a time. And it took hours, you know, and then, and you see, oh, there's the foot pad, you know, and it was incredibly exciting. Of course, the first time we got down onto Mars. Nowadays, we're used to digital cameras and our cell phones or DLSR, DSLRs. Uh, we're used to big arrays of pixels, megapixel arrays. And so, you know, MassCam Z is a, is a two megapixel camera, which is pretty good for space. There are higher megapixel cameras on this rover, but for us, it does the job. Uh, and its resolution varies because, of course, we go wide angle all the way to telephoto in stereo with those two eyes here you're seeing in, in this next graphic, the two eyes of mass cam Z up on the mast. And that mast can let us move around 360 degrees up and down. And that's how we build uh, panoramas. And you'll, you'll hear more about that from from Elsa. Uh, at the widest setting, we get about two and a half times better resolution than those Viking cameras. And at the telephoto setting, we get about 10 times better resolution than those Viking cameras. So the, those are great 
start to the legacy of, of imaging on Mars that we're, uh, we're picking up with this mission. And what an amazing opportunity, Jim, for you to be able to watch that growth. This is your fifth Mars landing and to be able to watch just exponentially uh, how these cameras have gotten better and better. So what kind of advice do you have for the future scientists and engineers watching today on what they will bring perhaps to the table coming up? Yeah, you know, uh, we've got a lot of uh, uh, young, young people and early career people here at ASU uh, working with us, faculty, staff, students. We have, I'm in the Mission Operations Center for MassCAMZ here at ASU on the Tempe campus. And uh, so we do a lot of the processing here. And I think what's happening is, you know, these students we work with and others, they're seeing the future of, of deep space imaging, these video cameras with these higher and higher megapixel capabilities with more infrastructure out in the solar system to get the data back. You know, we, we, we can talk about bandwidth and how, you know, we can take megapixels and movies and all kinds of stuff, but we don't have high speed internet to Mars, right? We have basically the equivalent of old style dial up. So that's, a you know, advancing that frontier, we're seeing incredible improvements uh, in our mission compared to previous ones in how we can get all those pixels into the tiny straw of bandwidth getting back to the earth. Uh, so I think that's just gonna continue to improve and we'll continue to send amazing missions out there and the instruments are gonna get more and more sophisticated, basically following the you know consumer electronics and all the great amazing things that are happening in digital imaging in our everyday lives. So much to look forward to as we look into the future. And speaking of that, you said it's been a feast for the eyes. I don't think we could ever get enough of that. So moving over to Elsa, Elsa, how do we actually take these pictures on Mars? Um, you know, it's, it's amazing actually. We started two years ago. And if I could have the mosaic image number three, number three, please. It, it actually, from start to finish, to take a picture like this in the box is about two years. It's taken a core team of six people um, starting two years ago to plan, test, and execute um, over 5,000 command parameters that go into this image. Um, and we, we took it only three years after landing, which in Mars time, Mars mission time, is just a blink of an eye. You know, you land and we already have to execute it. So we had to start a long time ago. You know, it's um, funny because when you take a paranormal like this on Mars, you're, you're thinking, oh, it's very technical, and it is, but it's in some ways the same as when you have your smartphone, because what you need to do is you have to look in the right direction, and you have to get the focus right. And that's really what we focus on um, when we're taking these images. We're millions of miles away though. Our selfie stick, if you will, is 150 million miles long. So when we take the pictures, we can't just go out and do it. And when we press the shutter button, hey, take a picture, it takes a day for the signal to get to Mars. And it takes another day before we get the images back. So we have that challenge of, of time and space, if you will. Um, so how do we how do we do that then? Um, we use our experience. Um, we've been doing this for a long time. We've actually been imaging um, for eight years with Curiosity with the mass cam, and that has led to uh, a ton of experience. We use our um, intuition, and then we have computer tools. And um, as we put all these things together, we we make a draft, we test it, we get results, some of them work, some of them don't, and then we test again. So I wanted to um, introduce one of the most important tools that we've used in creating mosaics, which is the command visualization tool called Viewpoint. And it was developed by one of our team members, John Proton. And it provides us with um, a way to visualize as if we were on Mars, looking at the Mars images behind it and the computer uh, model of the rover. Um, and then we can lay down footprints. Um, and that's a great way to pretend that, we've, that we're right there with MassCam, as you saw the pictures before, we're right there with MassCam taking the images um, and be able to visualize that. 
So if I could have the next picture, please. Thank you. You see here the frames, see all the red squares, the red rectangles, that's actually the footprints that we've laid down um, for this mosaic. And there's 142 total, like I mentioned before, there's fifth, over 5,000 commands for all together to take these 142 images that we stitched together. Now, in this case, we didn't land on Mars before we took this, right? We had to plan it in the blind. So we had to um, start with our information that we had available, which was from Curiosity. So two years ago, um, two of our ops engineers at the time, Jason Van Beek and Tex Kobachki, put together kind of a draft. And then um, that sequence we took into testing with the thermal vacuum chamber, um, which is house size. So imagine a small house that is in Mars conditions with the temperatures fluctuating about 100 degrees between day and night and also some of the air pumped out for vacuum and we tested in there and then um, we also got special permission to execute this um, sequence at Kennedy Space Center and that was important because of the focus um, we could get the landscape pretty well from curiosity um, but we also needed information on how to focus on the various details of the per Perseverance rover deck because that's different than Curiosity. So uh, we got that in the bag um, and thank goodness because that's what allowed us to put the sequence together, all, all of it in, um, in one sequence. We sent it up two weeks before we actually landed on Mars. Um, we do that to ensure that um, as a mitigation case, the communication errors right after we land, it was all fine. But in case we would have it on board already and ready to execute when we landed. So that's part of the, the thorough testing that we do um, when we're preparing to go to Mars. So as we got finally um, with all of that, we had our cognizant engineer, Mike Kaplinger here at MSQ. We had ops engineers, Tex and Angela and Chris and myself, we checked and rechecked, and then we were ready to fly. So if I could have the next, the next uh, image, please. Here's how we laid out the panorama. You see how we start at the horizon? Where Imagine being on the mast, you're looking one way and then looking next down the, down we go as we take the panorama and building up tile by tile from the horizon and all the way down to the rover deck. 142 different frames. You can see we have focus on the hardware, on the landscape, and it's all put together into one sequence. So it's great to be here today. Our team is loving being on Mars. We're taking already hundreds and hundreds of images with this camera, and we're going to take thousands, tens, if not hundreds of thousands in the future. We're so happy to be here from Mail and Space Science Systems and love working with Jim and ASU. Thank you for having us come along to Mars again. And uh, we just cannot wait to get going with this camera. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elsa. Such great information. And that was such an incredible animation there as well. And it obviously takes a village to get all of these images processed and put out to the public. And Kjartan, what's a calibration target and why do you actually need one? So all, all scientific instruments basically need some sort of calibration. You need to, to make sure by by imaging or measuring some standard, something that you know really well, you need to make sure exactly how the readings of your instrument translate to things in the real world. And we went through a lot of pre-flight calibration, a lot of activities to to image lamps and and uh, and dot patterns and other things with the cameras to make sure that we understood these instruments really well. Uh, and a lot of the instruments also have calibration targets on board the rover that they can visit and we have a calibration target that we can image to check that things are still operating as they should but our calibration target actually kind of has a purpose that goes a little bit beyond that um, and the reason is um, the mass, mass cam c is a color camera of course it, it acquires color images in red green and blue but it also has a whole set of of a special optical filters of what we call narrowband filters that are basically filters that image at sort of 
tightly around us a single frequency of wavelength of light. Um, and we have 11 different of them from a little bit into the ultraviolet, a little bit out into the infrared. And with all of these different 14, 11 narrow and, and three red, green, and blue, with all these 14 color bands, um, we can we can make some, uh, some color images that allow us to go a little bit beyond human vision and, and tease out differences in the terrain. Tell one rock from another or tell that two rocks are similar um, or tell layering in, in a cliff face or, or, or what have you. And also in things that might not be visible to the, to the human eye to standard red, green, and blue. Um, but when you look at, at a rock on Mars or a rock on Earth or anything, you're seeing a color that's a combination of the color of the light and the color of the thing, the rock. Um, so, you know, you know, you light shine red light on a, on a, on something, it looks red and you shine blue light on it, it looks blue. And on Mars, the illumination will change like it does on Earth. You know, the sun may be high in the sky, maybe low in the sky. It, the atmosphere may be dusty. It may be not so dusty. So it will change over time and it can change on fairly short time scales. And it's kind of hard to model. Um, and uh, so for that, we use the calibration target. And can I get slide number number seven with the calibration target? Um, so that's a, a just a, a little aluminum plate with uh, some patches, uh, ceramic patches in four colors and four grayscales and four rings in the same grayscales. Um, and these are, are colors and grayscales that we had char we characterized super well before we flew to Mars, so we know exactly how they reflect light. And so, so imaging this with the camera allows the camera actually to measure the illumination, measure the light that comes in. And then we take a picture of Mars, and then we can use that information to basically divide out that illumination. And we can then convert the image of Mars to what we call a reflectance calibrated image. And that's an image that shows the, um, the inherent color of the rocks and the soil, how they reflect light rather than the illumination. And that way you can compare them to images you took 10 days back when the atmosphere was dustier or image you have of a rock in your laboratory or, or whatever. And that helps the, the science team use the camera to pick out interesting targets uh, and so on. If you, if you give me the next slide, um, it's a, it's a close up of this calibration target. Um, and we're going to be imaging it a lot. And so we added some, some decorations and a little model to it. Um, and it's just been an amazing journey. Seeing it for the first time on the surface of Mars was amazing. I'm sitting here and it's 10 p.m. in, in central Copenhagen in the Niels Bohr Institute. I'm actually sitting in Niels Bohr's old office. He was one of the fathers of modern physics. And they let me sit in his office. They've left it preserved since he passed away in 62. Um, and, and everybody here that has worked on this project are, have just been so excited to be able to contribute to this amazing mission and be a part of this amazing team. Kirtan, that's are... amazing information here. And I actually have a social media question that's coming in that really pertains to what you were just talking about. Joshua Becomes on Twitter says, this is really incredible to see. I'm sure we all think that. Now, are these photos artificially colored? No, I mean, I don't, I know, Jim, if yeah. you want to. Well, sure. Uh, I, they... you know, Kjartan pointed out that uh, we've got all these different color filters. And when we take uh, pictures like this panorama in red, green, blue, then it sim can simulate what we see with our own eyes. But if we use the filters that are a little in the ultraviolet or a little in the infrared beyond, I call it superhuman, MassCam-Z has superhuman vision, um, then we can't look at them in red, green, blue, so we have to false color them. Kind of like a lot of the pictures you see from the Hubble Space Telescope. They're taken outside of human normal vision and they're false colored. And so uh, you're, you'll start seeing, once we start using those filters, and I know Kjartan's going to do a great job calibrating them, you'll start seeing these kind of Andy Warhol, garish views of Mars that don't look like what we see it with our eyes, but that look just like what MassCam-Z can see with its superhuman eyes. And like Kjartan said, that gives us some sensitivity to different kinds of rocks and minerals and just color variations. And I, I think of us as 
using the cameras kind of to do triage. You know, we, we can sweep this, these fields of view across the whole scene with the navigation cameras, the hazard cameras, and mass cam Z. And we're using color differences as a proxy for, well, maybe there's a really interesting chemistry there. Maybe there's interesting minerals there. Maybe there's an interesting texture. And, and we'll drive over and use all the ARM instruments that we'll be seeing and hearing a lot about in the weeks to come, use those to get uh, the much more detailed information. And I know, Jim, you made an incredible uh, storyboard with your teammates, and it really shows truly tour. how this camera can zoom. You want to take a little tour through this? Should we do that? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Well, so we're going to start. This is the full version of the panorama, 360 degrees. It connects on the left and the right. You could wrap it around, uh, and it goes right, right down to looking at our feet out to the horizon and a little bit of the sky as well. So go ahead and, and zoom to the first region here. We're going to zoom in on this panorama all the way behind the rover. This is looking to the north, a little bit northwest, uh, and you can see a couple of different ridges. There's a near ridge closer to us, and then there's those far mountains. The near ridge closest to us is the, the front edge of the delta, the Jezero Crater Delta that brought us to this site, that brought this rover to this place, and that we're going to eventually drive over to. Beyond that, those distant mountains are the, the rim of Jezero Crater. You know, Jezero is a big hole in the ground. It has these mountainous uh, uh, circular uh, rim of, of uh, mountains that surround us, and, and we're seeing them all in the edges of this, uh, this panorama. So those are pretty far away. Those are three, four, five kilometers away in the distance. But the delta itself, it's only about two kilometers, a little under a mile and a half or so away. So it's relatively close. The engineer's got us in a beautiful spot. And uh, uh, let's let's zoom back out and just look at a couple of the features. A number of the science uh, folks on our team have been looking at these different areas and zooming in and trying to do some instant science and analysis. And let's go to the first zoomed in region here. Zzz, uh, you're transported. Uh, you can see the resolution of the panorama, right? We, you know, we keep going in there, and it's like, wow, look at this detail. Uh, this is uh, just a, a, a blocky hill that we think is a separated remnant, maybe, of the original delta. Uh, maybe the delta was much larger, and it's been eroded away, but leaving these little blocky remnants behind. Uh, we see, you know, some evidence that it might be more resistive on its top. This is obviously our first look at it. Uh, we're going to be getting much higher resolution data. This is our widest angle zoom, so our lowest resolution almost on the camera. So we're starting to telephoto in to these now over the coming days and weeks, and we'll get much more detail. And then, of course, to get even more detail, we'll drive over there or somewhere near there. We'll get closer to these features. Let's go to the next one. So we'll zoom back out and get a get a sense of, again, the the, the wide scale, right? Now let's zoom into the next one. I think this is going to be another part of the delta. This is uh, uh, farther uh, towards the north and, and west part of the delta. You see some, again, this blocky kind of top to it. There's the faint hints of some layering in here. Uh, maybe, you know, we would expect that from what we've seen from orbit and from what we know about deltas, but it's really kind of a tease because we, of course, want better resolution and lots of folks thinking about what uh, what could be going on here, lots of sort of geologic comparisons to what's going on in deltas and other places on the Earth. Let's zoom out and look at some other features that are really close by, some individual rocks and other rocky regions. We'll go to the next one. I think this is going to go to, yeah, this is an area pretty close uh, to the rover that's uh, uh, been scoured by the retro rockets coming down. And, and delivering the rover on the sky crane. So some of the dust and soil has been scoured away, exposing these rocks with some, some layers. That white rock in there is about a half a meter uh, across or about a foot and a half across for scale. Uh, and uh, interesting uh, features and textures on it. Uh, we don't know whether these are volcanic, sedimentary, some combination of them. Uh, we don't have chemical and mineral data yet, but again, the cameras are helping us triage and identify the places where we want to get those detailed chemical and mineral measurements. Let's zoom out and go to the next one. We've got two more here to zoom in on. I love how it, it you just you, you get a real sense of the resolution uh, on this uh, panorama. Here we go. We're going to another 
interesting, weird little rock. This one is also about half a meter across, about a foot and a half across. And uh, it has uh, informally been called the harbor seal. Uh, and it is a highly eroded, probably wind carved rock. And we've seen rocks like this at other <clears throat> Mars landing sites. Uh, the, these rocks have been exposed to the winds of Mars for billions of years. And you'd think that the sand grains, you know, gently moving across the surface wouldn't do much erosion. But if you let them do that work for two, three billion years, you can create these just fantastic uh, forms uh, in the rocks. These are these are called ventifacts on the Earth, and we do see these kind of wind carved features. We think they're wind carved features, at least. We need to get over and take a closer look or get the high resolution on it to know uh, uh, better. And even uh, one more, we'll zoom out and zoom back into one more. And these, I think, are uh, this area, uh, which is uh, going to be to the to the right here, is even more enigmatic. Uh, and some of the most interesting stuff we're looking at. These are light toned, uh, pitted rocks that, again, part of the dust and, and soil that was covering them has been blown away by the uh, by the retro rockets. If, hopefully, you've you've all seen that great movie about the the crazy structures and the winds moving when the retro rockets came down almost like it was alive it's just phenomenal stuff so this was all has all been kind of cleared off a little bit and you know are these uh, volcanic rocks are these carbonate rocks are these some something else uh, you know do they have coatings on them we don't know we don't have any chemical data or mineral data on them yet but boy they're certainly interesting and part of the story about what's going on here is is uh, is going to be told uh, when we get more detailed information on these uh, these rocks and some of the other materials in this area. So let's zoom back out again. And uh, that just gives you a flavor for what you can do in exploring this panorama on your own. The uh, uh, NASA Photo Journal site has released the full resolution TIFF file. If you want to download that, it'll take a little while, 650 megabytes or so. But you want to wallpaper your bathroom with Mars, that's the file to use highest possible resolution and there are many of us on the team are just giddy and spending hours just pouring through this and place to place it's a lot of fun we've been or you I can mean, pick we've been the spending seal years <laughs> we've been spending years looking at at this site in satellite images from orbit that are like you know 25 centimeter per pixel which is amazing from orbit but you know, getting down on the ground and being able to, you know, pretty much maybe soon know what this all is and puzzle out the story is just, just super exciting. Very exciting. And I'm sure that's a general reaction from your entire team. I mean, we're taking a Zoom tour of the red planet and that just incredible detail, I don't think a lot of us uh, ever thought in our lifetime to expect. Yeah, it's pretty spectacular, and and more is coming. Remember, this is our lowest resolution panorama. Uh, we will get three times this resolution, um, and we're starting to get three times this resolution on selected targets in the field. Uh, and we'll pick that up in earnest once we come back from the software transition that's going on now. We're going from the cruise software to the surface flight software that takes several days. And so once that process is done, we'll get back to characterizing our cameras. The other instruments will do the, they need to do their calibration, their characterizations. So the whole rover is just sort of slowly coming alive, slowly turning on as the engineers check out system after system. We're very lucky to have been turned on and, and starting our checkouts very early and, uh, and getting all this great stuff out very quickly uh, to the public, including the raw images that went into this panorama, which have been released on the, the JPL public, uh, JPL NASA raw images public website. And as you might imagine, we've got so many people joining us today on social media. And if you want to have your questions answered, remember to use the hashtag Countdown to Mars. So let's get to a few of your questions out there. We've got a lot of them. A YouTube viewer asks, are the MassCam Z pictures used for stereo vision 3D mapping of the surface? Yes. That is a major, major goal of what we want to do. And it's an advancement that we're able to make over um, the mass cams on Curiosity, which Elsa and her team at Mainland Space Science Systems operate still every day. Uh, 
3,000 odd Mars days after landing back in 2012. So that those cameras, which fit on the same mast, we have a copy of that mast on, on Perseverance. Those cameras uh, have one wide angle left eye and one telephoto right eye, and they take spectacular pictures. They're just amazing. You've seen the pictures from Curiosity. Uh, the the problem in quotes problem is it's hard to do stereo. You know you have to do stereo at the the wide angle scale, so it's low resolution stereo compared to the telephoto lens, and it's just cumbersome to do it, and you need a lot of telephoto images to fill in, and so it's just not as easy and common to do 3D stereo with the mass cams on Curiosity. So the innovation that we brought uh, with our partners at MS Cubed to, was to design this zoom system so we could do stereo at the wide angle like we've got here and then all the way to telephoto. So there's a right eye, this is the left eye, this panorama you're seeing here of, of mass cam Z. There's a right eye version of this that's, much of it is still on the rover. We're trying to get it down as quickly as we can. And once we get all the right eye data down, we'll take the left and the right, and we're going to get a beautiful stereo view of this terrain at that scale. And we'll be doing that left, right at all of our zoom positions for everything that we do. And we use that stereo information, not just for science and the geology and the topography, but to help our engineering friends and colleagues who are driving the rover, who need that stereo vision to do hazard avoidance and and traverse planning to guide our friends uh, on the helicopter team who are trying to find a safe landing site, uh, a takeoff and landing site for the for the helicopter. They, they need stereo data, so MassCamZ can help with that. To guide our folks, our friends putting the arm down and the drill down onto the surface, they need stereo data. They can get it from the nav cams at lower resolution. We can give them even better stereo data with the MassCamZs. So doing that kind of stereo is a hundred percent part of our our goal and we're going to put a lot of those great stereo products out for the public to enjoy as well great jim another technical question from facebook ira Kali asks what is the transfer weight rate excuse me bandwidth and speed of data to the rover from the earth Ooh, oh my gosh do you happen to know that elsa What's um, the uplink rate? Well, I, I don't happen to know the number, but one thing that is um, an interesting um, number that I just heard the other day, which is, you know, we start really low because we have to make sure everything is working. So you start on your really safe antennas that have lower transfer rates. So that's how we started. And we couldn't get very much up or down. That's also why we had to put our first four days of commands on the rover beforehand, because we were really starting out. We, we wouldn't be able to send it all up in the beginning on these really low rate antennas. But very quickly on this mission, after we landed, everything was A-OK, -okay and they upped the transmission rates very quickly. And I just heard one of the mission managers um, yesterday tell us that at this point in the mission, comparing Perseverance to Curiosity, we have about 10 times the amount of data coming down every day that we did eight years ago when we landed. And that's thanks to the systems working really well and also that we have more orbiters, more assets at Mars that can relay our data for us and get all this data down. Otherwise, we would not have had this much data down already. Yeah, that's so true. We can I, I think the numbers are in the hundreds of kilobits per second. Uh, I think that's... We can go to the mega, yeah. yeah. We can, yeah. yeah. And Christopher has a follow-up to that question on Facebook as well. How much longer does it take to receive mass cam Z data due to the larger data sets? Hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. That's a great question. And it's, it's a little complicated because um, we're not in real-time contact with the rover. Um, you know, when Elsa said it takes a day to get the commands there and a day to get back, it's not because it's a day at the speed of light, it's because it's a day on our work calendar, right? It's because we communicate, we send uh, the commands up to the rover once per, approximately once per Earth day, once per Mars day in the morning when the rover wakes up. First thing it does is it listens, hey, Earth's going to call me with my to-do list today and radio that up, the deep space network that NASA runs gets its command list, and then we're out of contact with it. And it's just executing all those commands, take these pictures, test that instrument, turn on this heater, uh, wiggle the wheels, drive two meters forward, whatever. It's just a long to-do list with timestamps. It's doing it on its own. 
And then near the end of its day, one of the orbiters, NASA or the European orbiter, comes overhead and the rover relays its results back through that orbiter and then back to the Earth. And sometimes it comes very quickly, sometimes there's a little bit of a delay. But the end result is we're really getting a, a big pile of data once a day, maybe twice a day. Sometimes in the middle of the Mars night, we get one of those orbiter passes as well. Uh, and so it's, it's not, we're not joysticking, we're not in real time contact. But uh, at least in the first part of this mission, almost all those bits of ones and zeros coming back to us have been images. The videos that you saw, these spectacular panoramas, lots of engineering data and telemetry, but, but the imaging data is the vast majority of that stream of radio signal. All right, let's turn to the freezing cold nights of Mars. Taryn on Facebook asks, will Perseverance send in a night landscape shot? Hmm. Well, the one? thing about, yeah, yeah, absolutely. What I, what I really encourage people to do is imagine that you're the camera on Mars because our mass is up and it, actually the mass, is that about six feet? So as we look around, it's almost like you're standing there yourself looking around. And they are visible cameras. Um, they're primarily in the same wavelength that you can see with your eyes. And so if you're there at night on Mars, how much could you see? Well, it's really dark, so we can't see a whole lot. And that's, that's where we're at. We're not gonna take images at night for that reason. Um, and also because it's extremely cold. I mean, I was just looking at our temperatures the other day. We get down to minus 80 degrees Celsius on our cameras. And we do have heaters on board. We use them even in the morning or later in the afternoon if we need, when we need to, we use the heaters. But that much energy to heat us up that much in the middle of the night, that would just be prohibitive. So you've got two things against you. You got no light and you got too cold of a temperature. So we generally don't do it, except for a few um, a few occasions when we might be looking up into the sky and um, doing that at nighttime. But we do have to set it up beforehand. Again, we don't want to heat everything up. It's the cameras. It's the mass, the massive mass that you saw that has to be heated as well. So you want to set it up beforehand. So all you have to do is open the shutter to take the image, and then be done with your job. I'll I'll just add that you know you're absolutely that's a great description Elsa and um, you know the si the science goals of our mission are are focused on geology mineralogy chemistry also atmospheric science typically daytime uh, but the weather station the meta weather station will be measuring nighttime temperatures and pressures and all that kind of stuff so uh, for imaging it's difficult at night um, these are these are cameras not telescopes right it's not like taking your big light bucket telescope out in the yard and collecting faint signals. These are just cameras. So, you know, if you just point and shoot with your iPhone or your Android phone, it's it's hard to get deep space astrophotography kind of data out of that. So we can see bright stars. We can see Phobos and Deimos, the moons of Mars. Uh, and we'll do some of that science. We'll do some of that nighttime science. It helps us understand the atmosphere and the moons themselves. Uh, and it's sort of great bonus science if we have the power to run the heaters, if we have the power to run the cameras, uh, if there's scientific questions and scientific interests that we can direct at it, we'll do that. And we'll also, I, I predict, I mean, nothing is formally planned, but I predict we will do some re relatively fun kind of things, like take some pictures of the Earth. You know, take, uh, this has been done on previous rover and lander missions. Uh, we will take, one, you know, these are the ultimate selfies, right? Everybody on the Earth in that one pale blue dot in the sky. And so we'll probably do some sort of fun stuff like that too. And speaking of atmospheric science, Glenn on Facebook asked, does condensation form at night on Mars? Uh, Kjart is the physicist, so he should take that question. <laughs> well, it, it, it happens. Um, probably not that much here because we're close to the equator um, and there's not that much moisture. There's actually some pretty amazing images from Viking with frost on the ground. Um, so okay. it, it happens, but it will be frost condens condensating because the, uh, the atmosphere is so thin that when that the water can, can be a gas or it can be ice, a frost, but it cannot be liquid. 
And so it, it will go to frost on the ground and then it will go straight back up in the atmosphere. But you can get like, especially if you're not on the equator or close to the equator like we are, you can get the, like a frosty morning that uh, like you can get here on Earth. And Rachel on Facebook asks, how do you deal with dust on the lenses? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, I, get, I get that question every single time. That's, that's a wonderful question. <laughs> um, we actually, uh, we don't do a lot about it, actually. We, we mitigate, mitigate, we, we prevent uh, dust from collecting on the lens by pointing the cameras down when we're not using them. That, that end of the mass, we just point it down and uh, that, that prevents the dust that's always falling gently out of the atmosphere from collecting on our lenses. But we know that dust is gonna collect on our lenses when, when we're imaging and especially up at the sky and all that. And we can't point down all the time. And we don't have any little wiper blades or anything like that. No way to, no covers to, to protect them. So we just, we know that the lenses are going to get a little bit dusty over time. And, uh, and sort of two things. Uh, one, if any, anybody who wears glasses, I wear glasses, uh, I wear contacts, but I also wear glasses. You take your glasses off and just look at them. Elsa, look at your glasses. They're probably kind of filthy dirty, right? They've got dust all over them and specks and hair. But you put them on and you can still see through them. Right, and it's it's not that bad. You get a little bit of dust, um, and so we can live with that. And if it does get a little thicker, we can correct for that with our calibration that Keratin and others are working on. And secondly, what we've discovered in previous missions is that once in a while, the winds of Mars come and they blow the dust off, off the deck of the rover, off the calibration targets, off the lenses. And uh, so Mars has been actually pretty helpful in, in past missions and keeping our, our lenses clean. But our, our prevention is really kind of passive and just point them down. I'll add a little something to that because yeah. exactly this reason of the dust is why we had to get going really quickly without imaging. We wanted to take images as soon as we could of a clean rover deck. Well, as Kjartan can attest to, it wasn't entirely clean because, you know, all the dust that was kicked up. But specifically for Kjartan and the other scientists um, on our team, Jim being another um, big proponent of this, we wanted to look at the deck as, as cleanly as we could so we can compare that to all the data that comes after. And that was one of the big reasons we were allowed to image as early as we did. And in fact, even the day before we imaged this one, we took... Um, we took a huge amount of calibration target data. And um, that was really so that the calibration could compare to that for the rest of the mission. And we'll continue to do that and monitor, you know, take images on a regular basis to monitor the dust um, that's accumulating. And it's my understanding, Kjartan, that there's some special places on the Cal target that deals with dust. Maybe yeah, we could show if you can put up again. slide Kjartan. eight in image eight. So it's obviously a problem for the calibration target too, that, and that is always facing upwards and dust will drizzle on them. No, um, slide eight, the, the major slide eight. Um, so they get, they will gradually get dusty and sometimes the dust will get blown off a little bit and they will get dust. That's the one. Um, and actually right at landing, there's a bunch of dust that gets kicked up by the rockets, right? We wanted to image it right after landing as quickly as possible. That's the, the cleanest it's ever gonna be. Um, but it has these, you can see how the dust just rings around the patches. And that's because we build in these very strong hollow cylinder magnets that are sitting right underneath those surfaces. And they attract the dust to where the magnet is, but in the middle, the magnet is not. And that area is kept fairly clean of dust and that will work also for the dust in the Martian atmosphere. It, it works because there's iron in the dust, both in this dust and in the dust that comes drizzling down from the atmosphere. So those magnets are gonna keep those little areas pretty much clean of dust. And those colors are gonna be like they were in the lab when we measured them. Um, and we're gonna be trusting them still. But another thing is that on other parts of the calibration target, it will gradually get dusty and, and we will be able to monitor that. And that's actually kind of a little extra um, a piece of, of, uh, of meteorological data because we can sort of tell when the dust is falling and when it gets blown off and it's like a seasonal thing on Mars. I'll, uh, I'll mention that uh, 
Kjartan wrote a great uh, blog piece on our uh, public website, and Marina will give you the address at the end, all about this target and all about the magnets and the, why the colors were chosen and the little messages and, and vignettes and all that and the, the sort of uh, artistic elements that we were able to put on this with help from the Planetary Society and Mark Hilberto, who's an artist who works with, with the society and a small group of us on the team. So I encourage folks to check out Kjartan's uh, article that's on our website. And speaking of that, for Kjartan, J.E. Bruce on Twitter wants to know where he can get his hands on one of those sundials. And can you tell us more about the sundial? <laughs> Maybe I should start a company and just crank him out. Yes. And sell him. That is great. <laughs> we have a few spears. When you send an instrument, you have to build a flight spear in case something goes wrong with the instrument before you launch. So we actually have two flight spears. They're not for sale. And we have a few extra sort of... Uh, test units, um, but it's only a little handful and they'll probably wind up in museums where you might be able to see them. Tim has a 3D printed version there and we, we, we do we do have 3D print files that maybe we'll, we'll put out at some point. Maybe we should put the 3D idea. print files on our public website if you're willing to do yeah, that. Yeah, we but could do that. Yeah, sure. sure. Absolutely. So this just gives you a sense of scale. This is full size. Yep. So yep. there it is. And we did have, uh, you mentioned museums, we had the, the flight spare for the Spirit and Opportunity Cal Target was on display in the Smithsonian uh, for many I months. There. It was special, cool. Special exhibits yep. about those rovers. So lots of people put their eyes on that one. Yeah, I re remember I went there, Jim, and I, I wrote that I, I just came back from standing in the in the in the August presence of the of the Apollo eleven command module and you wrote back, how about the August presence of the spear? Pan Can Cal Target. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and I said that was a flight spear. It wasn't the flight Cal Target. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Well, as a, as, a meteorologist, we, as a meteorologist, we're getting tons of weather questions. So I'm really excited about that. Everyone is very excited talking about the weather on Mars on social media this afternoon. Chopra on Facebook asks, any storms expected there? And how do you manage them? And how would they affect the mass cam Z? Yeah, I mean, we don't manage the weather. <laughs> we do not manage it. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the great thing about the fact that we've had 60 years of exploring Mars with flybys, orbiters, landers, and rovers is that we really know a lot about the weather, and it is very repeatable from year to year. Not precisely. Some years are different. Some years have these big dust storms that cover the whole planet. And we don't really understand why they, those form in some years, not others. But in general, you know, everywhere on Mars has a dusty season and a less dusty season. And there's always small dust storms all the time. And sometimes it's cloudy and with water ice clouds and sometimes it's not. But we understand a lot about those patterns from these previous missions. And so, you know, we landed at a time that's not a particularly problematic for dust uh, storms, but there will come a time when there will be m more of an issue for dust. It's not so much of a concern for perseverance and curiosity, nuclear powered rovers, as opposed to the solar powered rovers, Spirit, Opportunity, and solar powered missions like InSight. Uh, you know, the, ultimately it was Mars dust and dust storms that killed uh, both Spirit and Opportunity because of the dust settling on those solar panels and the dust darkening the sky uh, and cutting off their solar power. Uh, so we, we care about the way it changes temperatures. We care about the way it could mess up our lenses. Uh, so we do follow it and track it and pay attention to it. But honestly, we mostly care about it scientifically because it's a really interesting part of the weather. And we're trying to learn as much as we can about the weather on Mars so that once future astronauts and settlers go there within the next few decades, they'll have a really good understanding of, of what to expect and when at different times of year. Elsa. Yeah. And then there's also a little story about how we captured some sand in the uh, cameras with Curiosity mm -hmm. right. that gave us a nice lesson learned for, for this mission. So what happened was during dust storms on Mars, um, sand would deposit, we have these long lens covers that keep stray light from coming into our images. Well, they're also really good at trapping small, sand, small, small amounts of sand. And we didn't even think about this um, until one day 
when we were looking up at the sky, as we talked about, and we take images, you know, at different angles to look at the atmosphere. And we noticed there's some, there seems to be something off. There's definitely something off in these measurements. And we looked into it further and we compared, you know, over time, how did this exhibit itself? And uh, Mark Lemon, who is one of our um, most prominent atmospheric scientists, looked at his data as well. And we realized there's something in front. There is absolutely something in front. So we took some experiments um, and we determined that, yes, indeed, when you go up and when you go down, it looks different. Just very um, proof, really, um, a strong indicator, as we say in the scientific world, um, that we had sand inside the lenses. Well, you can't just go up there and sort of shake it out, right? That That's not how it works. Um, so we still have a little of it um, inside the, the covers on Curiosity. And what we learned from that was on these cameras, we drilled a little tiny hole in the enclosure so that if we do get sand inside this time, it will trickle out on its own and we won't drain have holes. this problem. Yep, little drain holes. Good yeah. lesson from Curiosity. Yeah, it's actually kind of amazing that little sand grains are hopping across the surface and bouncing up six feet and going into the front of our, the, the lenses are set back a little bit. There's like a sunshade and a baffle. So there's a little bit of volume there. And on, on Curiosity, they're hopping up in there and getting in there. It's totally surprising. Or getting, yeah, it's like the storms are not, the, the storms, you know, the winds can be high speed, but the atmosphere is so thin that the power in them is not very high. It's not like it's gonna jiggle the rover or tip it over or anything like that, but it can still move sand and obviously dust, but, but it's kind of surprising how much it can move sand, even though it's such a thin atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like that carved rock, you know, how, how long it took to do that. You know, that uh, a lot of people have seen the movie The Martian, and there's that scene in the beginning with this violent storm. You know, I mean, it's it's a dramatic and, and fun scene, but it's science fiction. I mean, it's nothing like that. I mean, the wind speeds can be very high, but it would be like somebody blowing, a, you know, a feathers by you. It would feel just so light. It's so thin, um, but it moves sand and dust. Uh, very efficiently. And you're constantly looking towards the future. And so DBL on Twitch asked, what changes have you made to the rover design to better suit the conditions of Mars, which I think Elsa just answered with adding those holes so that you are able to, to get that dust off. So we'll move on to Harry on Twitter, who's asking, could you please describe the software you're using to stitch together that panorama? Is it mm -hmm. custom software developed in-house or using commercial software like Lightroom or Photoshop? If custom, what what operating system is used? Go ahead, Elsa. Great question. Yeah. Do you want to start, Jim, or you want me to take it? Uh, you start, and I'll finish. Okay. Sounds great. So, could we have that picture again with the frames on it? It was a second. I think it was number five. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. That is such a great depiction of what my life, what our team's life looks like um, on a daily basis. This is homegrown software. As I mentioned before, John Proton wrote it. He was actually um, way back on Mer, going back now almost 20 years. He was one of the operators that would do commanding and then realized at one point, you know what? I can do this software much better than anything that's commercially available, anything that people have thought of, because he did the job. And then he took his software programming skills, put the two together, and came up with this tool. And it it truly is um, the only uh, software of its kind on this planet. So it's specifically customized for um, visualizing, imaging, and this is just one way of um, looking at it, but there's a lot of details that goes into it that's at our fingertips. Um, the distances to each uh, part of the image, what the focus would be that would correspond to it. There's just a tremendous amount of um, power behind it. So we're extremely grateful to have this. And in fact, it's thanks to Jim working on PanCam with John. And then we did a beta version for um, MassCam on MSL that we've been running now for years all of it with the thought that we would get this tool for this mission with these cameras. And it is spectacularly paid off. It is exactly, I mean, it's more than I could even imagine. You know, um, Chris and I were talking the other day, one of my ops engineers, 
and he was just laughing. He's like, I cannot believe this piece of software. I don't, I don't even know everything to do with it yet. I can't wait till we can explore it more. And we all feel like that. It's, it's amazing. Uh, so it's, a, it's, there's a lot of custom homegrown software, uh, but we also do occasionally use Photoshop or those kinds of commercial tools uh, to, to finish some of the processing and, and stitching. So it's, it's a mix. And, and like you, oh, sorry, go systems. ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to finish up on the question, the operating systems. Um, we really use all kinds. Um, we're using, um, some of my team runs on Macs. We also have some Dells. Um, we use Linux. And um, just throughout, we are a team of hundreds of scientists and engineers. If you count them all up, there's probably thousands. And we use all kinds of, of um, tools make them all work together. Our tools that we run for the mission that all of us run have to run on all those, um, you know, well-known platforms. Yep. And there's all and kinds of programming in C, Python, MATLAB, IDL. I got some old Fortran stuff that I can still use. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a real uh, wide array of programming. Not only a wide array of programming, but it's a village. And thank you so much for everyone's questions out there on social media. So many of you joined us today, and we'll try to answer some of your questions as we progress through the rest of the day and tomorrow. But thank you most of all to Jim, Elsa, and Kiartan for joining me this afternoon. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, we just have to thank all of our teammates on the, the, the MassCam Z team, on the entire rover team, the NASA, the JPL team, the folks who built the rocket, the folks who got through COVID to get us to the launch pad. I mean, what an incredible team, thousands of people involved yeah. in ultimately getting to this kind of, uh, this kind of spectacular imaging. Yeah. Thanks for having thanks us. Thanks so it's much, really you guys. Exciting. Yes, thanks for having us. Oh, thank you so much. We can't wait to see the rest of the panoramas. Now, for the latest on the mission, follow at NASA Persevere on both Twitter and Facebook. And you can also take a deeper dive at the mission's website, mars.nasa.gov slash perseverance. And as Jim mentioned, there's lots of information about the MassCamZ instrument on the website, mastcamz.asu.edu. And the very latest images can be found at mars.nasa.gov slash mars2020 slash multimedia slash raw hyphen images. A lot of great feast for the eyes, as Jim likes to put it. Now, thanks so much for watching this afternoon and go Perseverance.